I want you to think about your dream. The world ain't all sunshine and rainbow. It's a very mean and nasty place, and I don't care how tough you are, it will beat you to your knees and keep you there permanently if you let it. You, me, or nobody is going to hit as hard as life. If I have learned anything, it is the power of hope. It ain't about how hard you hit. It's the power of one person. It's about how hard you can get one hit. One person can change the world. And keep moving forward. How much you can, how much you can take. By giving people hope. And keep moving forward. Respect everyone. That's how winning is done. Know that life is not fair and that you will fail often. Now, if you know what you're worth, now go out and get what you're worth. But if you take some risks. But you got to be willing to take the hits. Step up when the times are the toughest. And not pointing fingers saying you ain't where you want to be because of him. Face down the bullies. Or her. Lift up the downtrodden. Or anybody. And never, ever give up. Don't stop. Don't stop. Don't stop running toward your dream. Welcome to the Radical Humanists with your hosts, Dr. Thomas Coleman and Michael V. Yeah, we just get off. I mean, we just get off. Yeah. I don't know. I, I have no I idea. Nothing. Oh, my God. Oh, <clears throat> I was going to start this episode off again with like another clip from Kamikaze Choir, but I decided that this would be the episode where we don't mention Scott at all. Okay. Because we so really, we're, like, we're not going to talk about Scott. No, not even a little bit. Not we're, a little bit. Nope. Don't. No. In fact, there is no Scott. There we're is not, no Scott. No. no, Scott does not exist. <laughs> This is not the Church of Scott. This is not the Church of Scott, and we're not. He is gonna. not a walking deity. <laughs> so, <laughs> I have two topics that I wanted to discuss today. Oh, good. And um, originally, uh, I was going to start with the topic that was really important, but I think I'm going to talk about the one that's really important to me. Perfect. Yeah, because I don't. Because the other one is just sort of like, eh. I mean, it's important, and it it might actually help somebody. But uh, you know what? Fuck them. I'm <laughs> <laughs> like, it's important. We started start it off in such <laughs> earnest, and now we're just like, fuck <laughs> you. If you have both arms and both legs, we don't want to hear from you. <laughs> Look, I'm not saying this other thing is not important. I'm just saying it's not important at most people. Yeah, fair enough. So <laughs> I'll take it. Okay, so let me let me set the scene for you. Let's roll. Let's let's and and if the listeners have opinions on this, I'd like to know. I I would legitimately like to know. I might even put up a poll on like Instagram or or the website or whatever. Oh God! So <laughs> becoming increasingly more frightening. <laughs> That's, that's quite should, good. For those of you listening at home and playing <laughs> along with the board game, I don't know what he's about to say. <laughs> Like we have this new game. Yeah, we it's, don't tell each other. We don't tell each other topics anymore. We just come in. And like by the way, like that's what we've devolved to. But it works for so, us. We don't care about you, but it works for no, us. No, I, I do care about them because the, the oh, no, second of thing we do. The second thing I want to talk about is sort of important. It's actually really important, but but this is more pressing at the moment. So look, um, Lucky Charms just released a new limited edition St. Patrick's Day version. <laughs> I'm not kidding, man. This is serious shit. I can tell by the tone of your voice how seriously you're taking this. <laughs> like, we haven't stopped laughing yet. We were laughing before you said the fucking words <laughs> Lucky fucking Charms. So Lucky Charms <laughs> released... The radical Humanist. The book about Lucky Charms. Oh yeah, by the way, welcome back to the Radical <laughs> Humanist, a podcast that believes in your right to live free of the social emotional constraints that limit your human potential. And now and Lucky he, Charms... Lucky Charms. And Lucky Charms released a limited edition St. Patrick's Day version of their cereal. And the the thing that makes it St. Patrick's Day is it's in now in a green box and it turns the milk green. Okay? So it is, and it's, it is very clearly geared towards St. Patrick's Day in its marketing. Now, here's my question. And I'm being 100% serious. Y'all got to tell. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah we, we've started off on a very serious note. Lucky Charms cereal and Lucky the Leprechaun, its mascot, are inherently Irish, right? Like, nobody's debating this. 
They are Irish, correct? The fucking thing has a name. You didn't know that Lucky was the name of the leprechaun? No, I yes. didn't know that. Fucking yes, that's his name, Lucky the Leprechaun. <laughs> of course it is. It's Lucky's Charms. Those are Lucky Charms. They're, like, they're lucky because they're lucky, but they're lucky because they are his charms. Okay? Oh, I got you. Okay. So, oh, all right. So there's a backstory to this. Well, that's why, like, okay. that's why like, we want, it's like purple horseshoes and, you know, these are Lucky Charms and they are Lucky's Charms. Gotcha. That's why he's always looking for his lucky charms. Okay. Anyway, don't I? I could really go deep into the history of like cereal uh, and yeah. mascots, and but anyway. So all right, so Lucky Charms and Lucky the Leprechaun are inherently Irish to begin with, right? The product in and of itself is Irish themed all day long, every day. You have it, right? Can sure. we all agree on that? It's not uh, French. It's yeah. not Japanese. Absolutely. It's not Samoan. It's not you know. It's it's Irish. Yeah, he's a fucking leprechaun. Exactly. So now. By taking a product that is inherently originally based off of Irish mythology and now using it to promote St. Patrick's Day, turning it green and blah, blah, blah. Does that make it more Irish or <laughs> because, because it's, now, it's, it's now being used as a gimmick, does it make it less Irish? Well, it depends on how you view the Irish, right? But that's... Okay, so wait. Now, that's the second part of my question. Having Lucky, the leprechaun, not only be the mascot for Lucky Charms, which in and of itself is inherently Irish, as we've all agreed. Yes. But now being a uh, a shill for St. Patrick's Day... You know, I'm, I'm losing IQ points as we go. Like... <laughs> But being being now being used to promote St. Patrick's Day, <laughs> yes, does that destroy his Irish cred? Yeah, like the, like that, like does he have as much street cred now right. because he's sold out to the man? Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Now yeah. I'm well, not. He got sold out to the man because he's probably only two feet high. Right? Well, so with his shillelagh. So right? <laughs> well, is he like? Is he now simply just a corporate shell? You know what I mean? And how yeah. does that play into the conversation of cultural appropriation? Because you have companies like Cream of Wheat. Whoa! Yeah, you have companies <laughs> like Cream of Wheat and Aunt Jemima who are eliminating their tried and true mascots due to cultural appropriation and in insensitivity because it 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 plays up to stereotypes. So isn't having a leprechaun promote St. Patrick's Day in this country kind of skirting that same line well he's white but he's irish yeah but look what else is you know i mean and i say that because it's it, he gets a pass because of privilege. oh i see okay so lucky has privilege he has white privilege he's getting a pass i guess so or because why else wouldn't they say take him off the box i don't know that's what i meant that's that's my right? question yeah i mean and i say that in support of those who take offense to, you know, the portrayal of Aunt Jemima and all that. Don't get me wrong. I, I mean, you know, um, I don't know how that initially came out, but um, w the way it was meant before we start getting the hate mail, C-O-L-E-M-A-N. <laughs> haven't done that in a few episodes. Um, I say this in support of those who find offense in, uh, in such things as, uh, you know, the inappropriate portrayal of minorities and things like that where you know um nobody notices him it's true now back, but he's also like a cartoon character well but back in the 70s and i think it extended up until like the early 80s maybe it didn't go as far as the 80s there was a character called frito bandito who was a Mexican for he was a Mexican yes. portrait stereotype uh, for Fritos, and the yes. problem there was that he was a bandit. He was you know he was a you know criminal. He kind was of a criminal thing. kind of character. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah I think you know. Um, I don't think anybody on the planet has given this as much thought as you. Probably not. <laughs> and so, as a result of that, I don't think there's going to be much of an uproar. <laughs> Over a cartoon fucking leprechaun on a box of cereal. But I get what you're saying in terms of um, appropriations. I think that um, if they had gone 
you know, if, if they had always been portraying him in a in a manner different than they have and are, things would be different. Well, I, you know, there is another podcast that I listen to. Uh, there's only one other podcast besides this one. So you're either listening to that one or this one. There's no other podcast. There's, yeah, there's the, nothing. The market is not saturated at no. all with podcasts. Nope. And um, oddly enough, it has to do, the podcast has to do with Bigfoot, surprisingly enough. Now, it's there's two, <laughs> there's two hosts, much like this sort of situation, one of whom um, is a real big Bigfoot believer, really believes in Bigfoot. Um, and he gets upset when Bigfoot is used to shill for products. He does not like that Bigfoot is the mascot for Jack Link's beef jerky and has appeared in like insurance commercials. He thinks that that's disrespectful to Bigfoot. How do you feel about that? Have I, you given I, I, that I, ever I, any thought? I, I've n- no, <laughs> never in my life. Um, anybody standing and, and first of all, I want to let's back up and talk about somebody standing up for the honor of fucking Bigfoot. <laughs> Okay, because that, that's the topic. Like that's 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 the topic, right? Like that's what needs to be discussed yes. or, or considered. Like uh-huh. the man is 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 defending the honor of Bigfoot. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. He's, not just his honor, his credibility. His credibility. Like <laughs> for like for whatever reason, he believes Bigfoot has earned cred. You know. Um, so, and, and I say this assuming, you know, um, this thing even ex- like exists, right? So like this, this tall, hairy thing that lives in the woods that no one's ever Okay, wait, uh, we're going to have to stop right now. Like, we're, we're, we, if, if we don't both acknowledge the actual physical, factual existence of Bigfoot, I'm leaving right fucking now. <laughs> <I'm not going laughs> Taking my mics, and I'm leaving. <laughs> I was, you, had, you had me until factual. <laughs> well, I mean, let's be honest. We live in a time where the term "alternative facts" is a thing. Oh no, that's true. <laughs> so, that's true. So, so it I doesn't mean, have to be true. So, we can right. just say it's true, right. it's and an then al- therefore it's, it's true. An alternative fact. It's an alternative fact. That's right. <laughs> I forgot about that. Okay. See, I'm. I see. I made the mistake coming into this, r- based in reality. <laughs> Why the? Fuck? And now we're talking about Bigfoot and fucking <laughs> leprechauns. Whatever. Got you know? you, what brought you to the point that this was going to be based in reality? <laughs> I don't know. I, I, I have no idea. <laughs> I, you know, my mistake. My bad. Um, so okay, so let's let's go with it. Let's ha- let's let's have a little let's have a little brain fun with. Now my brain is going. You know what? You can enjoy this. <laughs> have fun with this. Don't be so serious all the time. You're too serious. Have I am. I this. I and so and obviously I bought two boxes of it. Of course you did. Um, and I'm just not sure if I'm allowed to eat it. Like I don't know if like, like is Bigfoot's going to come and get you? Well, no, what, like, because what? I well I mean, am I? contributing to the to the cultural the appropriation of of lucky's culture by eating these lucky charms and by the way you already did by buying it well i mean maybe i bought it to take it off the market so that nobody else could buy it okay fair enough yeah like people who buy books to burn them maybe i'm gonna maybe i'm gonna gonna burn these okay all right so so i i see the dilemma i mean i i myself am gonna have problems with this now for 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 days (laughs) I'd also like to state for the record that I fucking hate St. Patrick's Day. <laughs> <laughs> and this coming from somebody who on the last episode was hung over from drinking whiskey all night. <laughs> My hypocrisy knows no, no, bounds. no bounds. No bounds. No bounds whatsoever. I do hate St. Patrick's Day with an absolute passion because it's... It's fucking here in New York. It is amateur hour. It yeah, is I'm just, neutral on it. Um, I never made a big deal out of it. I never. <clears throat> well, I have a really. Did I ever tell you my St. Patrick's Day story? Did no. I tell you this? No. I have. I have a St. Patrick's Day story. You know how when people drink and they drink too much and they get really sick, they have a drinking story. Like it usually happens yeah. with tequila. Most people are like, oh god, I got a tequila story. I have a St. Patrick's Day story. <laughs> <laughs> so I was working in Manhattan. This is years and years and years ago, and I was working in Manhattan. And as most people who live on Long Island and work in Manhattan do, they commute via the Long Island Railroad. And uh, that's what I was doing. 
and it was St. Patrick's Day. It was the day of the St. Patrick's Day parade in Manhattan. All right. Okay. So, you know, I think I was on the train trying to get to my office where I was working. I think I was, I was like, I don't know, 535 in the morning train, Some, something like that. Yeah. I always took like, I always made sure to take the early, like the train that's the earlier version, the earlier train before the big rush hour uh, crowd starts commuting. Just because I didn't want to be, you know, it's still crowded. I yeah, mean, it's still smart, every seat's though. taken, but but it's you know, it's, it's not like a cattle car, right? Exactly. Yeah. Um, because the commuting trains are just fucking nightmares. So anyway, this was like the five thirty five train out of Huntington, going into Penn, which is an exactly it's exactly one hour ride, <clears throat> and it was already packed with drunks heading into the city. These these people were already drunk, like they were. They must have started like the day before, and they wow. would just continue drinking. Ooh. Man. So it's bad. Like, it's just, it's not a fun ride. And then there was a girl, this young fucking girl. I feel so bad for her. Even to this day, she was dressed in full um, parade garb. She was, she was obviously marching in the parade. She was probably about 15 years old. Yeah. And she was completely dressed and she had a, a she was carrying bagpipes with her. And she was just minding her own business, trying to keep a low profile. And then like one, somebody in the car saw her and then, you know, like a big chant started for her to play the bagpipes. Oh man! And they they were, they were relentless. Like these guys were just drunk, and they were relentless, and they were like, play the bagpipes, blah blah blah. And she finally relented. And I think we were at, I think it was like the wine dance station, okay. which which for those listening at home is only like the third stop of twenty to get to Penn Station, which is in Manhattan. Which is in Manhattan. So at the wine dance station, she started playing the bagpipes. And she did not stop until we got to Penn Station. Oh, so I was man. in a train car filled with drunks and this poor girl being forced to play the bagpipes for like 45 minutes. Oh. Now, I don't think the bagpipes on a good day is a, <laughs> is a sound that I want to hear. Yeah. No, not inside like, of a train car, man. That must have been loud as it hell. It was loud as hell. It was. It didn't stop. Like I can still hear it to this day, oh, yeah. but it was, it bounced off every wall in the train car. And then these guys are fucking cheering and it was just a goddamn nightmare. And I could not wait to get the fuck out. And like, so ever since then I've hated St. Patrick's day. I cannot stand the sound of bagpipes. Like don't like any, like, I, you know, green beer. And I, I don't even go for shamrock shakes at McDonald's anymore. Yeah. Like I just fucking <laughs> do not. Do you, did you ever, do you remember when uh, McDonald's used to, years ago, like when we were kids, they used to advertise the Shamrock Shakes and they used Grimace's uncle from Ireland. And I don't think they ever used the word Ireland. I think they always used the old country. Like that was the term for yes, Ireland. And he was I, like, yes. uncle, he was like, uncle O Grimace. Yeah. <laughs> yes, I, 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 I can't believe it, but yes, I do. Actually. I, I, I can't believe I'm actually saying this, uh -huh. but I, I do remember that. Yes. That was a while. Oh, ago. it was a long, long time ago. Yeah. yeah. And before that, when they first, this is, God, I, I, I can't remember anything important. Like, this is why I'm never going to get ahead in my career. <laughs> um, when they first introduced Grimace, he had six arms and he was a villain. And I don't know, like, what happened to, like, he must be a listener of ours because he lost a couple of limbs. Because yeah, he lost a few limbs. Yeah, apparently we're, <laughs> you know. Andy and fucking that's a yeah that's a call for those just tuning in that's a call back to our last ep two episode last two episodes last two episodes somebody wrote in they're missing a leg and somebody wrote in they're missing an arm so we're collecting people with missing which we're limbs. proud as hell of yeah I think it's great I think it's fucking great so all right so um where are we on this whole lucky charms thing so um the cultural appropriation and you're um contributing to whether or not um you are uh whether or not you're contributing to to it yes. um, by consuming the product. Yes. Um, um, I say no. Okay. Okay. If somebody, um, it, it, yeah. Okay. See, but I don't take offense to stuff like that. No, um, yeah, neither do I, you know, um, I understand. Um, I get where people are coming from when they do take offense to things um, that are a little more, um, <laughs> a little, a little more, more, a little more uh, important than the bullshit. A, I'm talking about. <laughs> a little more insulting, a little, a little more, you know, a little more, in, I, I guess, insensitive. Yeah. Um, to to be kind, um, I, I get that, you know, um, I understand that. Um, however, I do think that we, um, you know, we have been completely wussified 
as a culture um, in, in many respects, but I do understand, um, and I and I tend to agree with um, with some of the uh, some of the more um, cogent opinions of of people who are um, who are offended by varying things. But um, I don't I don't I don't think Lucky. Is that his name? <laughs> yes. It's okay. Lucky. I don't think. I just, it's just I just, not, it's just not I just a hard to get it. I just want to get it right. Okay. Yes. Um. I, I. I don't think lucky. Um. I don't think you have anything to worry about with lucky. I think you could. Um. You can drink your green milk. Um. <laughs> with your feety pajamas on. <laughs> Um, Which, watching cartoons in the morning, um, and, <laughs> and do it guilt free actually. Um, you know, um, I don't, I, I really don't think you're going to have a problem with that. Um, there was a up until, well, COVID put an end to this, but, um, there was a, uh, there was a theater, a movie theater in Williamsburg called the Nighthawk cinema that, um, every Saturday and Sunday they did this thing called, um, tunes, booze and something. I forget the name, but it was like tunes and booze or whatever. And um, <clears throat> you would go there at uh, like morning. You'd, you'd go there in the morning. I think it started at like a, either 1030 or 11 o'clock. Yeah. And then they would show, it was 90 minutes long. They would show 90 minutes worth of Saturday morning cartoons on a big movie screen. Cool. And they had an all you can eat cereal bar set up. Wow. Yeah. It, it, like Like 14 or 15 different cereals. And then- um, this is one of those like sort of um, hipstery type um, cinemas. They serve you know, like they would serve like good food and stuff like that. Like you, you know, like not just popcorn. Like you can get like re- like a real food there. Um, but then they also did cocktails that were based on cereals. So like oh, wow. cereal infused cocktails. <laughs> Holy shit. So it was like it was like tunes, booze, and tunes. Yeah, cartoons, booze, and something else. And um, sounds like your like version of Nirvana. I dude, I fucking loved it. I. I absolutely loved it. And I had tickets um, and tickets would, you know, it was put on by a spe- like a certain an outside group. Like they rented the space to do it in the theater and then it just caught on and they like, they were doing it forever. And um, I, I went a bunch of times and I had tickets to the last one that they were supposed to do before they shut down for, you know, COVID obviously you just couldn't do it anymore. Yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, man, I can't wait for that to start up again. That was <laughs> fucking, it's worth driving into Williamsburg for this thing. That's, that's how, that's how really? yeah, it is. But the problem is, well, it was a problem only at first. Like the problem was that you'd go, like the first time I went, I was like, I was like a kid in a candy store. I was like, this oh, is the greatest thing ever. I'm going to sit I, here, I, watch I, cartoons, drink fucking, you know, cocktails made out of cereal and there's an all you can eat cereal bar. I was like in I can't imagine the twinkle in your eye. Oh my eye. God. It was, it was ridiculous. The problem was, was that I left crocked and now I'm in <laughs> fucking Williamsburg. <laughs> You're having out and smell like fruit loops. But I found the, the, I found the antidote to that was right up the street. It's, it was like maybe, I don't know, like a 200 feet from there was this kick-ass country bar. It was, it was great. It was oh, this cool. fucking amazing country bar. Like, and like, it's like somebody had picked a, a real country bar from somewhere in, you know, go fuck yourself, Alabama and yeah. picked it up and put it in the middle of Williamsburg. Like yeah. it wasn't hipstery at all. Yeah. Um, Something from like, you know, the like the, yeah. the, the, the oh dead parts of Texas. Dude, you know? It was so good. So we would go from there to there and drink until we got sober and then we'd go home. Okay. <laughs> which is always <laughs> recommended. Which is always, you know, drink until you feel sober, which you definitely know you can then drive <laughs> home from fucking Williamsburg. Well, they had good food. So like we would sit there and eat food and like we would, like we wouldn't, that's where we would go to sober up. Yeah. Right? But, yeah. But whoever was not driving would, would continue to drink. <laughs> So, so anyway, yeah, man. So I, all right. I, I know we have a real topic that I know there was something. Oh, I know what I wanted to talk about. Okay. So this is the part where we actually help people. And I don't know that this is, but wait, there's more, but wait, there's more. Um, this is something that I don't know really how to dive into it in a meaningful way. And the reason I didn't bring it up to you was because I'm curious to get your take on this. Um, and how it relates to uh, healing and trauma. Because I know for me how it relates to mindfulness, okay? Right. And how it, and, and, and then how mindfulness relates to spirituality okay. or vice versa. In whichever order, order you put those through. Um, 
But we talked about resiliency last time. Yeah. And we sort of we sort of touched on this a little bit. But I want to know what your thoughts are on developing empathy for people. Uh. Because I don't going through my particular brand of trauma, right? Yeah. Led me to having not only a deeper understanding of myself, but a deeper level of empathy. Because I don't mm-hmm. necessarily think I was ever, it's not like I was a callous person, okay? I wasn't mean. I wasn't, although I acted in ways that were selfish, um, it wasn't my intent, right? Mm-hmm. I didn't. I didn't go into it saying, this is all about me, but it's just what, it's just how it happened. It's just what I did. Mm-hmm. And so it was later that I find that I fully started to understand and then embrace the concept of empathy. All right. Now for the those, concept, not the actual experience. Well, I don't think you can, I don't think you can adopt the actual experience until you actually understand what empathy is. And I think that's what my problem, I know that's what my problem was. And I think that's why I think that's what happens with a lot of people. I think a lot of people com, um, confuse empathy and compassion yes, or empathy and pity. Yes. And so, or sympathy or sympathy. Right. And so I want to, before we get into anything else, I just want to outline what it is that we're talking about. And yes, I'm going to read this off of, off of my notes. I'm this, I'm not going to even pretend that I have this committed to memory. So what is empathy? It's the ability to understand another person's thoughts and feelings in a situation from their point of view, and that's the important part, rather than your own. It differs from sympathy, where one is moved by the thoughts and feelings of another, but maintains an emotional distance. So that's that's the definition, more or less, of empathy. And by comparison, and again, I'm going to read this off of notes, Pity, feeling pity is a negative emotion. Compassion is a positive emotion. So that's the difference between pity and compassion. Compassion equates yourself with others and is close to the feeling of others. You sit with them. Feeling pity for others is not sharing their feelings and become, you you know, and you become an outsider. Um, It is a feeling of pity to feel sorry for others and then do nothing. So while, while it's, you know, Yes, pity is technically a negative emotion. I don't think it's it's negative to have it. You know what I mean? Like I don't I think actively pitying something is is can be detrimental and can be construed as being negative. Compassion, obviously, we should all have compassion. For me, my the my pivoting point, right? The thing that started to make me pivot was the deeper understanding of empathy. Mm -hmm. And while having a strong, uh, a stronger understanding of it ultimately led to more feelings of depression, because I think for me, when I started to really put myself in other people's shoes, it, it was very eye opening in a way that like, holy shit, I did this. Like, uh, this is what I did to somebody. Like, this is how I was. This is, this is what I made. I made them feel this way because of X, Y, and Z. And so that was a pivoting point. And that was my first step to, uh, to knowing the self, which is what we call, we talked about uh, three episodes ago to four episodes, whatever. But it ultimately, and I don't know how, how this translates to everybody else, but it ultimately led me to being able to handle my trauma. And it was key to handling my trauma, mm. being, 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 under, being able to understand and fully embracing empathy was the thing that got me to build up my level of personal insight to where I was able to then scatter over to working on my, my trauma, my, mm-hmm. my, the, the trauma that had, you know, literally, um, infested my body yeah. you know it infested my my every part of me which is what it does what right which is what it does um and i'm curious to know because i don't see this when i see people talking about healing from trauma i never hear them talk about empathy ever never 
I only hear them treating trauma as though it were a physical illness, you mm-hmm. know, like, oh, take two of these and call me in the morning. Yeah. Like the, the one guy that we don't want to talk about that we both can't stand. He who shall not be he named. He who shall not be named. I don't ever see that in, in those, in that process. I don't ever see like, look, in order to better understand, in order to better, to become a better person. Like I needed that, like this was great because it really truly did. I needed it to help me become the better person. Mm -hmm. So I guess my question is to you, since you deal with this a lot more than I do clearly, um, and you come from the, the, the clinical end of it, does this ever come into play? Like, does that acknowledgement, does that, you know, sit yourself down and put yourself in that person's shoes right now, like see the world the way they see it, feel the world the way they feel it, then come back and try to equate your own feelings to that. Like, where is that connection? You can, you can do that. Um, you can have, you know, for, for, for people who have, um, experienced significant trauma and are experiencing the, the, you know, are experiencing negative uh, results from it. Some some people experience trauma and don't have any lasting effects. But barring that, and focusing more on those uh, who experience trauma and experience uh, negative effects, you know, PTSD and things like that as a result of it, um, to be able to put yourself in the shoes of other people who say have been traumatized. Um gives you a sense of relatedness i don't um i don't see a whole lot of it either um in the field um it's not something that i see a lot of it's some it's a it's a it's something that i i do um i do touch on with people but not for comparison's sake because when you start talking about empathy then you walk a fine line between relating and comparing and when you relate, then you're saying, you know, yeah, I hear you. You know, right. you get you you give them or you get if someone if someone relates to you, then you get what what we call um, a felt sense, um, which is a term that means that you feel heard. Okay, you feel felt like I feel you. You know that's right. where that saying comes from. You know, I hear you. You know, like that means that, like you know, I I get you. I I understand you. I'm I'm with you. I'm not just listening to you, but I'm hearing you and feeling you. You know, I get it. Relating that, but the problem that we run into, um, or that people run into, is that very often that will um that will morph into comparison and so it's a bit depending on the person right in terms of treating people in terms of working with people in terms of coaching people teaching people to to use empathy as a tool or to introduce empathy as a tool is a bit tricky which is why it's not really used very often because the person who's been traumatized tends to at least it's been my experience tends to morph that suggested empathy even as explained thoroughly as it was into comparison okay and comparing one experience to another oh, and okay. like they had it way worse than i did and so i don't have a right to my feelings and then they feel invalidated and then you got a big fucking mess see it's funny like <clears throat> it's it's mu- it's uh, I'm a very, uh, I'm clearly a very visual person, right? I work on visuals yep. and, and you know, that's, that's just one of the ways that I process things. And, um, I use them, um, in, I use a very visual sense when I'm, when I'm writing something or, or when I'm explaining something to somebody, I try to use visual cues because it, it, it creates a more tangible situation for me and makes it more real. So when I was talking about my trauma, I, I would relay it as being complete rubble, mm-hmm. right? Just imagine a building that was just, sh- not even just a building, an entire city that had been leveled yeah. and there was nothing but piles of rubble. And in order to rebuild, I, the first thing I have to do is clear away the rubble. I have to, and the rubble was the, um, the emotional distress that was inside 
right? Yes. So that was that was the, the physical manis- manifestation of the emotional stress was was the rubble, and I had to get rid of that before I could even start to rebuild. And once that was gone, or at least once it was, because it's never truly gone. There's still smoldering ash, and there's still smoke and whatever. But once there was enough of a clear path, the cornerstone of the very first building that I rebuilt was empathy mm. like i used it as a block okay. like and i physically I, I mentally looked at it that way like this is the block that i need in order to rebuild this building and once this building is rebuilt tenants will come in and they will rent space and then i'll be able to move on to the next building and, and that's, build a life and right exactly and that's exactly how i did it but i needed the empathy kicked into high gear and it's not like I was, I suddenly, it's not like I turned it on and then was like, I'm going to go donate all my money to charity and I'm going to go help this guy shovel snow. And I, that's not what I'm talking about. Like, sure. It was just, everything I did was internal. Like it was all personal, but I don't necessarily think that I would be able to begin to understand myself, to develop that sense of self until I had that firmly in place, until I had that building block firmly in place, because it definitely, it, without question, it, um, it was like drawing the shades back on a giant window and being able to finally see more than I had, I was able to see in my own myopic sort of little portal. And, 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 and again, it's not like I was, you know, it's not like I was Hitler. I wasn't a dictator. I wasn't, yeah. a, you know, I wasn't killing people. Yeah, sure. But looking back on it now, with the unfortunate benefit of hindsight, I am able to pinpoint the things that were wrong that I couldn't see at the time. And it's because there was the lack of empathy. Well, I think also it's important that you, not you, the right. hypothetical you, that you, you, um, that individuals, that people, that we, um, understand that sometimes we tend to get caught up in semantics in that, um, Empathy, as you're describing it, sounds very much like relatedness. So it sounds almost yes. like you needed to learn, and I may be wrong, but it sounds like what you're saying is that, and we haven't spoken about this previously, so this yep. is this is off the top of my head. Um, it sounds like what you 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 needed to learn to do was to relate to other people's experiences. Yes. Which allowed you to then secondarily develop, like cognitively relate to them. Say, yes. okay, all right, uh, okay, I understand that this is what they've been through, and I, I understand now that this was bad for them, just like what I went through was bad for me. But it was different situations, but still, everything is relative. So, right, without invalidating, without it, right? invalidating, and saying, okay, that's really bad for them. You know, what I went through was really bad, but what to them, what they went through was really bad. And then secondarily, after that what typically happens is that then the emotion kicks in, which is where we get empathy, which is when you put yourself in their shoes and then you feel for them. Yes. Yes. And that directly ties into what I wanted to mention here. And again, I'm going to read this. I'm not even going to pretend that I have this committed to memory, but while I was one of the things that this has always stuck out with me. I've had this for a while. Like this isn't just something I pulled up now for this episode. I've had this for a while because it's always kind of stuck with me. Um, because it's, it's, first of all, it's just something I didn't really know. Yeah. So, you know, new knowledge is good knowledge. Um, unless you're building a bomb. Uh, <laughs> yes. <laughs> but, um, but yeah, this is just something that I always, that really kind of just, it's just one of those things I read a while ago and it stuck with me. So I'm going to read it here and I'm, I'm not going to read the whole thing cause it is, it gets very verbose. Empathy is an enormous concept. Renowned psychologist Daniel Goleman, not Tom Coleman, but Daniel Goleman and Paul Elkman have identified three components of empathy, cognitive, emotional, and compassionate. We will briefly discuss them below by learning how to empathize with your friends, coworkers, and those around you using three types of empathy to build stronger relationships and trust. I'm just going to briefly touch on them. Cognitive, simply knowing how the other person feels and what they might be thinking, sometimes called perspective taking. Or relatedness, as I said. Yeah. Right, or relatedness, exactly. Emotional, 
When you feel physically along with the other person as though their emotions were contagious, which is exactly what you just said. Yeah. Um, this, um, this type of empathy can also extend to physical sensations, which is why we cringe when someone else stubs their toe. In this case, you would look inwards to identify a situation where you were similarly anxious about the future, blah, blah, blah. Okay. The last one is compassionate. With this kind of empathy, we not only understand a person's predicament and feel for them, but are spontaneously moved to help if needed. Mm. Um, That's it, more behavioral. And, and then they say it is the balance between cognitive and emotional empathy that enables us to act without being overcome with feeling or jumping straight into a prob problem solving process. Now that, okay, so that part is important because people, and this ties directly into what you said about being seen, there are lots of times, and I am absolutely guilty of this, where my own sense of self-worth was tied into what I was capable of doing for somebody else. Mm -hmm. Okay. That is a confusion of empathy. That is not, in fact, empathy at all. No, it's very self-serving, as a matter of fact. Right. It's incredibly self-serving. My desire to help rather than listen or act rather than just be was also self-serving, but n you can't see it at the time. No. And that's because there's, you know, there's, there's this illusion among vast amounts of people in the world that altruism exists. Yes. Which it does not. There is no such thing as altruism, right? You, you, nobody does anything and gets nothing out of it. Right? Nobody does anything for someone and gets nothing out of it. And Even if it's an internal no, feeling of right. satisfaction. Exactly. You're, you're still getting something out of it. Right. You're still getting exactly. Exactly. Right? So compassion really speaks to more, um, not to question the research, of course, um, but um, to me, w what I got out of that was com the compassionate part was the behavioral component because they talked about the cognitive, they talked about the emotional, right. and then they talked about the compassionate, which I would label more the behavioral because that's the part where you actually take action as a result of the cognitive and behavioral because first you have to have the cognition and then the cognition leads to the emotion. Yeah. And then the emotion leads to the behavioral. And what they're calling compassion is really describing the behavioral component of empathy. It's it's describing that you moving in for the right reasons and doing something to help someone for 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 reasons that are healthy. Yeah. Not for reasons that are self serving. Then, but then again, everything is self serving that we do for other people. But that's a whole in the show. Um, so that those three components and I'm, I'm really glad i said the first two because I was like, <laughs> let me tell you something man i'm really glad i was on with those first two you were I got, back, I got backed up with research that's so right fucking cool as hell and for i me. and i've had that for a while like that's fucking, not something i just pulled out of my ass like i've had that for a long time fucking yay me because what i just said i totally pulled out of my ass <laughs> but you know once, once you have the once you have the cognitive and you 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 understand and then that that allows the emotion to come out and then once that emotion comes out and it's not like, a, I don't mean like a flood. I just mean like your ability to feel. Yeah. Then you, you may, not all the time. It's not like a lockstep thing. And I'm sure if, you know, if you went further into that article that you, you would read to us that it, they would probably say the same thing. It's not a lockstep thing where every time it happens, but that then spurs the behavioral, which is the, in, you know, your, your initiating of behavior to assist another person who you can then relate to. So you're like, oh man, that sucks. I know I've been through things that suck too. I'm going to help you. Like someone sponsoring someone in Alcoholics Anonymous. Right, okay. You know, I've been where you are and I'm reaching out, you know, you ask me to help you, I'm going to help you because I know what it's like for things to suck. I don't know what it's like for the things that you're going through, Yeah. but I know that when things sucked for me, they sucked bad. And so if you need my help, I'm willing to help you. That's what they're calling the compassionate part, which is, you know, for me, because I'm a cognitive behavioral psychologist, that's more behavioral in nature. Yeah. And I don't necessarily, th like, I, not necessarily, but I absolutely do not think that uh, empathy requires action. 
You know, oh, no, it doesn't require you know, it. No, not at all. And, you know, and I think a lot of people, specifically the self-serving people, mistake that. And I, But I, but I think they're aware of that mistake. I, I don't think that happens subconsciously. I think most people who are like, I'm an empathetic person because I went and helped this person. Like, Oh, definitely. There's there. so much of that. You're like, go fuck off. Like, you're not. You're- <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, there are people who are just, um, you know, they're just out to the they're, they're, they're not, I shouldn't say out to, but their their focus is helping people for the for their own benefit. Yeah. For oh, what yeah. They get out of yeah. helping other people. Absolutely. You know, whether it's even if it's just bragging it's, rights, exactly, bragging rights, credibility. Yeah. You know, um, whatever it might be, social standing, whatever it might be. There's a lot of that. Yeah, fuck, fuck those it, people. Fuck know. those people. Yeah, yeah, fuck them out loud. Exactly, because that's so disingenuous, and it really is a disservice to those people that they help. Because, and that's where pity comes in sometimes. Yeah, because you look at this poor, look at this poor bastard. You know, like, yeah. you know, I think I'm just going to throw this guy a bone and and help him out, and and, and you know, and that's why pity is is. Um, is defined as as you defined it, you know, because it's just like, oh man, look at you, yeah. like you would pity a dog, yeah. in the rain, you know, and it, it doesn't it, it it doesn't serve anything, you know what I mean? It's not except like a, ego, it, yeah, except ego. You know, it's funny the um, <laughs> these mics are picking up like motorcycles outside. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Who's riding a fucking motorcycle out there now? Oh it's, man, I get them all the time. Yeah, there's snow on the ground all the time. <laughs> oh my god, um, I. I'm, I'm not going to say I'm friends with this person. I'm not, but I know them. They are an in, an intuitive medium. Her name's Deborah Hanlon. You might want to look her up. Um, I when when my mother died, um, my family, specifically my aunt, did that thing that a lot of people do when a loved one dies. They're they're looking for clues. You know what I mean? They're oh, looking yeah. they're yeah. looking for a sign. They're you yeah. know, they do whatever they do. And and I get it. I believe me, holy shit do I fucking understand it. The problem is is that there are people who take advantage of that and it's a very easy group to manipulate. Oh, it makes you an easy mark. It's it's it unbelievably fucking easy. So when you see people like John Edwards and, you know, people who Long Island medium that fucking Yeah. I, I get sick to my stomach because I don't know if they believe what they're saying. I certainly don't believe them. I, mm-hmm. You know, I can spot a, you know, I can spot a carny from a mile away. The ticks are all there. You know what I mean? Like every every trick in the book is being used. The the tells are all on the table. And yeah. but but you you your audience are starving to death for something, and it's very easy to to feed them. Anyway, so my aunt. Uh, went to, after my mother died, my aunt went to see this woman, Deborah Hanlon, who does not say, she calls herself an intuitive medium. Um, okay. and, and she does the whole thing about, you know, getting in touch with dead people. And I was like, eh, whatever, like, okay, if you want to do it, if it makes you feel better, fine. Yeah. You know, if you want to sit in a room and try to get a reading, whatever. Yeah, why not? And so we went and um they this woman did her thing and i was i was not impressed at all you know yeah. it was all it was you a lot, there? yeah i was there it was a lot of hit and misses and then when we were when the show was over we were leaving and this took place in a restaurant just like a regular restaurant we were leaving we're walking out the door and she deborah hanlon flagged us she came she came up to us and she started she's like wait i just want to say something to you i don't know if it's going to make any sense Mm. and then she started saying things like we the show was over like people had paid their admission and people were leaving like there was no reason to to do this yeah it was after you know and uh she started saying certain things um specifically about um a, a, a white dog in a closet and all this other shit and Every single solitary piece of it was like completely accurate. It was like 100% accurate. We had not filled out any cards. I did not give her any clues, any tricks, any anything. Like I would not given her any indication of any of what she had said. Yeah. And I intentionally didn't, like when we had to fill out the cards, I didn't use my real name, told my aunt not to use her real name, the whole bit. And anyway, so 
everything she she had said to us and again keep in mind this was after the show was over she had no reason to talk to us at this point we had mm. paid she had gotten her money mm. she had said a bunch of stuff and it was all 100 percent accurate mm. and so at that point i said okay well there's clearly something else happening here this woman had no idea who you are um she didn't, it's not like she mentioned my mother by name, but she mentioned all these other things that were just very, very specific. And this was something that happened after the fact. This person came to me to say these things. I didn't go to them. Mm. And then uh, we also have, uh, there's also, we have a listener who's very much into that as well. And I find it astounding. And the problem I have with this whole thing is that it all sounds very woo-woo. And you know me. Yeah. I'm not a crystal guy. Yep. I'm not a woo-woo guy. Yeah. I don't have a fucking talisman on. I don't, you know, I don't read tea leaves. Yeah. I, I stay as far away from that as possible because for me, everything, I need to be able to touch things. I need, I need it to be tangible. I need mm-hmm. it to be real for me. And I'm not dismissing any of this. I, uh, I would never dismiss it. I'm not so arrogant as to say this is impossible. This doesn't exist. This is not a real thing. You're all making this shit up. Maybe your crystals don't do anything. I, mean, I don't fucking know. Yeah. Maybe they do. Yep. It's like people who say I don't. Believe, there's no such thing as God. How the fuck do you know that? Yeah. Like, it's an unanswerable question. Yes. And so, I stayed away from the whole concept of any of that for so fucking long until it was sh- until I, f- I was forced into it until i did not have another choice yeah i, ha- I had to adopt ep- empathy i had to I, yeah i yeah. literally had nothing left nothing else to do yep and um i guess the point of that is just to say that like i'm just amazed that it's not I, and i understand why now like I, I i legitimately did not know why it was not an incorporated part of trauma treatment because yeah. for me it was integral I couldn't have, i could not have done it without it well, yeah, I think it, it it is. It's just like I said. It's a matter of definition, you know. Um, it, it could be what you're what you're what you're characterizing as empathy. You you know, you know, you related to people, and that allowed you know that was the cognitive component of it. So empathy, you know, is part of you know part of it in a way. But it's it, it, it's a tricky part, you know, because you have the cognitive part, and then it, it's it's it's. It's it's a fine line. It's yeah. it's you know it's difficult, especially with you know depend it, also depending on how traumatized somebody is, the recency of the trauma, the type of trauma, the nature of it, the, you, the age of the person, their, their 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 willingness to 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 work and understand what you're what you're teaching them and things of that yeah. nature. There are a lot of variables that go into it. Well, trauma. I mean, from what I can see, trauma treatment, uh, healing from trauma. You know, without the willingness to do the work, you're completely fucked anyway. You're fucked. You're just totally fucked You're anyway. fucked. Don't even try. <laughs> you don't even try. <laughs> I love the. De- it's true. I mean, it's, it's absolutely true, but I love the definitiveness of that statement because the people that travel in the worlds that we are doing, you know, that we travel in with this podcast, yeah. they don't take that definitive approach. They take a very sort of namby-pamby, yeah, come in, come out, kind of, you know, we'll, yeah. you know, like a massage, you know yeah. what I mean? Like, yeah, yeah. well, fuck Yeah, it. there's always a way. Well, no, there's not always a way. Some people are just fucked. <laughs> because if you're not willing to do the work, then nothing is going to help you. Exactly. Exactly. And that's just the, the, like, that's just the way it is, you know? And so you can teach somebody, you know, all you want about, you know, the, the, the nervous system and, and, yeah. and the, you know, the, the, you know, polyvagal theory and, and, and you can teach them about, you know, how different varying, you know, the exercises and techniques and things of that nature will assist them in overcoming trauma. And, you know, I, I don't personally, you know, as a coach, I don't need to know what your trauma even was yeah yeah you know um i don't need to know what happened to you for you to help you yeah you know I, not you I just in no, general I like, yeah to, for me to help someone i don't need to know what happened to them i don't need to know what 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 they've been through lucky charms culturally you know? appropriated my identity yes apparently it has you know all i need to know is that they're willing to do the work and if they're willing, willingness is the gate to success and the willingness is the gate to healing. And that goes, and the, okay, so willingness and work, the, not just trauma people, 
if you don't show up to work and do the job, you ain't getting paid. And That's it's it. the same fucking thing. It That's is it. the same fucking thing. I don't care if you're a construction worker. I don't care if you're a lawyer. I don't care if you're just trying to clean out your basement. You don't fucking show up and do the work. You ain't getting the benefits. That's all. So that's what it is. Anything go. else is self-serving, wallowing in your own shit, and I don't have any time or patience for that. So don't fucking call me if you're not willing to do the work. Sorry. C O L E M A N. All right, we're gonna do a little. So what's up with you? All right, here's my here's my. So what's up with you? Spiel. You ready? I feel like you should read this at some point. We want you to know that you are more than just the sum total of your struggles. There's more that makes you, you, your likes, your dislikes, your interests, your hobbies, your day-to-day, your dreams. We think it's just as important to focus on the calm as it is the conflict. And that's why we want to know. So what's up? So it's up with you. So it's up with you. So it's up with me. Well, let's see. Last time we uh, last time we recorded, we talked about the CD, right? Talked about the CD, and um, that um, that's what's up with me is that we've been. Uh, there's been some interest um, internationally um, in, oh, the, in the CD. Wow. Um, a couple of radio stations, um, which is, uh, which was pretty gratifying, you know, and, um, that's you know, awesome. Yeah. I mean, I'm not packing my bags and getting on a tour bus no. or anything, but, it, it, but so what, you know, that's not what we're doing this for, you know, by the way, we're talking about Kamikaze choirs, new EP cover your tracks. Yes. So yes. Check it out. Thank it's you. on, uh, um, I'm trying to where it reverb nation. It's, 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 um, uh, streaming on reverb nation and it's free and it's free. It's all free. Um, and I think it's going up on Spotify soon. Like yes. A, yes. Is. So, okay. So check yeah. out Kamikaze choir, cover your tracks. It's fucking brilliant. It is absolutely, absolutely brilliant. It's- yeah. We do four cover songs and, um, you know, and, and, um, we've gotten some, uh, we've gotten some, some international, um interest in just you know just playing the music yeah yeah you know just asking us hey you know can we play your music that's great and um you know that's really gratifying because you know um you know we we've been we've been doing we've been at this for a while and uh individually you know um three of us you know we've we've all known each other forever you know um you know, I've known Scott and Rich. We're not, we're not supposed to say Scott's name anymore. Guitar. Oh, that's right. This isn't the Scott show. That's right. Sorry. <laughs> well, I've known he who the other he who must not be named, um, and and Rich uh, are, are two guitar players. I'm I'm the bass player. Um, the incredibly f- handsome Rich. For, yes, the incredibly ridiculously handsome Rich. Um, for like thirty years, you know, I've known um, I've known Steve our drummer for for close to that amount of time and um you know we're we're in a good place you know we're just really good friends doing doing some really cool rock and roll having a really good time and then you know we put this out and then we get some some interest from some cool places you know and so that it was just a gratifying thing to hear and um and hope you know hopefully it'll continue it hasn't been out very long and um you know we'll see where it leads you know once this uh disaster is over with this pandemic maybe we can actually get to play these songs in front of people but uh, it'd be fucking great that yeah, would be that would mm-hmm. be so what's up with you um i want to talk a little bit about a personal failure because <laughs> i think it's important i like to i mean i i am a big proponent of uh not hiding from uh you know your failures or your shortcomings or things that you know i i i put them in front of me as a, as a means of keeping focus. So, uh, for the last two weeks, I have been, um, interviewing with a new company that I was really, uh, I was really psyched. Like I, like the interviews were going great. I had like a bunch of zoom interviews. It was going really great. Um, it was down in Charleston, South Carolina, which is where I really want to fucking be. Um, and it was for a pretty good sized company good product whole bit and uh first zoom meeting went really well um they scheduled another one i fucking went really i was really i 
kicked ass on that one. They sent me a design test, this whole package of stuff that I needed to design and lay out for them, which I immediately sent back and completed. And I actually did it like I did two versions of them and they were really taken aback by the like, holy shit, this is amazing. Um, they liked my background. They liked everything I had, blah, blah, blah. Anyway, and then they listened to the podcast. And then they listened to the podcast. Actually, uh, podcasting is what um, uh, was one of the things that got me to another, like a second round of interviews because they were like, oh, wow, you have podcasting experience. We, that's like, we really want to introduce podcasting into our, into our media. We just don't have anybody that doesn't. We don't, you know. And I'm like, no, I, can, I, I got my own podcast. I do podcasts for my nine to five, the whole bit. Yeah. Um, they listened to this. They thought it was really I mean, it, it's not what they do, but they were like, no, we, we thought it was great. You know, it's, it's conversational podcasting, which is what we really wanted to, you know, they also wanted to do scripted episodic podcasts and which I have experience in and blah, blah, blah. So it went really, really well. Cool. Ultimately, I did not get the position because I do not live in Charleston. Oh, shit. Right. So I was, I was real, and I'll be honest, I was really disappointed. I was really, really crushed. Yeah, I'd be bummed too. And, and, but they didn't tell me initially that I didn't get the job because I don't live in Charleston. They just said they're going and, you know, they just sent the standard email that just said going another, we're going in another direction. All right. And so, you know, not only was I crushed and bummed, but then I, you know, started to, you know, that whole imposter syndrome thing started to sneak in like, well, maybe I do suck. Maybe I'm not talented. Maybe I'm just a hack, which yeah. is what we were, we've been called. Yes. Yes. But so I allowed myself, I don't know, maybe let's call it 20 minutes, half hour of, of feeling of, of, of I allowed myself that 20 minutes of that depressed state that yeah. to be there to, to soak it all in and say, yeah, this sucks. This is blah, blah, blah. <clears throat> but then I said, okay, this is just a numbers game. Yeah. Um, this didn't work out, but this will not, this will not stop me from making this happen. I'm going to continue doing this. I'm going to, this is this, this will happen. I'm going to do this. I will not, I will not let this setback stop me. I will not fail at this goal. I will get to my, I, I will achieve what I'm trying to achieve. Of course. And, um, and this literally just happened. So there hasn't been any, like, there's no, there, you know, there's no amazingly happy ending to the story. It's just that I have persevered. I have, mm. I have acknowledged my failures and I have acknowledged the fact that this, no, this didn't work out. Just like in our intro says, you know, you, you will fail and you will fail often. Yes. Okay. But there will be a time when I don't fail, and oh, I, yeah. I am now a step closer to that. Mm -hmm. And so that's pretty much what that was. That's that's what I've been dealing with this past like two weeks. And and it was, I, you know, I took a lot away from the experience of just talking to him. Sure. Um, and this wasn't some like magical dream job or anything. It was just more in line with the work that I should be doing. Um, you know, for my nine to five. And good thing was the good thing about this position was that I would go down to Charleston for like a month or two. Uh, learn the system and then I can come back here and do it remotely, which is what I wanted to do. Oh, like, okay. I, like I, yeah. I, and it would have been nice because it would have given me two months, two, two and a half months of the shit cold weather here. I would have been yeah. there <laughs> <laughs> and then just come back and set up, you know, set up shop and, and work remotely, which is, you know, yeah. I'm work, uh, you know, I'm working remotely now. Um, I don't love it. I really don't like working remotely. I like being in an office. I like being surrounded by people. I like the, mm -hmm. you know, um, you know, there's a, there's a, it's a better atmosphere. Um, but this would have just put me in a better position to, to do other things and, and just meet new people and blah, 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 and sure. support an area that I truly love. But more, it was just, um, getting out of Long Island for two months. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and what really sucked, what really, really sucked was, uh, I got, the email saying i didn't get the job the same day we got the fucking major blizzard so oh, i was like great. oh you mother <laughs> oh man you can't come down to beautiful charleston exactly. and here's a shit ton of snow i hope they're not listening to this episode <laughs> <laughs> so yeah man that's i mean it's it, and it's fine it's i'm i'm legitimately cool with it because like it just kind of it it recharged me a little bit and it refocused like what like I, you know, it was just like, okay, you're fucking, you're fine, man. You're going to, things are good. You're going to, you got two puppies you need to take care of and fucking. Oh yeah. 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 So now nah, that'll be, this is, that's a total bounce back. It's nothing. Yeah. It's nothing. Um, I don't have uh, we don't have any email. I did a, I got a spam email from somebody who wants us to, uh, 
join his podcast network, but it's totally spam. So uh, I could read that if you right. want, but no, fuck it. Yeah, no, nah, fuck it. <laughs> <laughs> fuck him. I got, I got lucky charms I need to get home to. Yes, you do. So, so listen, if you want to reach out to us, we are hello at the radical humanist.net. We are on Instagram. We are on Facebook. We are, we have cell phones. If you know the number, feel free to call, but I'm not giving you that number. Um, I don't know. Send us a smoke signal. Send us a fucking telegraph. Do people? Yeah, we can get a telegraph. We can get a telegraph. Yeah. What's yeah. the thing? What's the thing where people like do, 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 Morse code? Morse code. Send Morse us Morse. Yeah, that's that's what that is. Yes. Um, uh, if astral anybody, projection. Astral projection. You could do that. We'd, yep. we'd love that. Yep. That'd be fantastic. Yep. Um, yep. yep. Remote uh, viewing. Remote. Oh my god. Remote viewing. I want to yep. try that. Yeah. <laughs> there's a big UFO guy that does remote viewing, and he claims that his his powers of remote viewing bring ufos really yeah i swear to god look up uh dr adrian greer he's a uh, he's the leader of some ufo project that cult yeah you know, it's a it's a complete <laughs> he's a complete fucking he's a con artist like uh, like a re- first of all he's a he's a an unbelievable narcissist um um and any credibility he might have had at some point in his career and his ufo because he, he was a real doctor he's like a he was like a trauma physician or some shit like wow that. yeah yeah and then he transferred over to finding ufo or summoning ufos with his he went to crazy land <laughs> he went to... but he makes more money now <laughs> and, well there's money to be made in crazy land look at some of the motherfuckers in our area <laughs> so yeah check out dr adrian greer and his uh, his remote viewing ufos it's really it's it's fucking delightful <laughs> and on that note we'll probably get sued Anyway, uh, thanks for tuning in. We will uh, we'll catch you next week. All, All right. right, peace, peace.